I did my first disability case in 1981. I um, set up my own law firm in 1988 to do nothing but this work. I am a past chairperson of the Chicago Bar Association Social Security Disability Committee. I helped create the Social Security Disability Committee for the American Trial Lawyers Association. I have testified before Congress on these issues. I have been on 60 Minutes. Um, I am a past chairperson of the National Alliance on Mental Illness and a past chairperson of the Alliance on Homelessness in suburban Cook County and now work with a group called CHARGE, which is a fascinating coalition of homeless service providers and medical institutions in Chicago uh, working to solve a lot of these types of problems. So this is my thing. And I really am pleased to be back with Gilda's Club. I've spoken downtown a number of times. Uh, I'm happy to reach in a further uh, wide swath of people by being online, but I'm really ready to get back in uh, into downtown on Wall Street and talk to everybody in person. And hopefully that can happen again soon. What we're going to do tonight is, well, let me, before I do that, let's share the screen now and let's get this going. So bear with me a second. All right, Sophie, can you give me a thumbs up? Is my screen showing? All right, excellent. So what we're going to do tonight is talk about what the law is and what it really means to be totally disabled. What does that phrase mean? We're going to talk about SSI and SSDI and the differences between the two of them, because the differences are important and you need to understand when you're doing your own planning. We're going to talk about how Social Security thinks about cases, because honestly, they do think about every case. They just usually do it wrong. Um, but we're gonna walk you through the analysis that'll be used in every case that Social Security hears. We're going to talk about the, how the program has changed, and then we're going to talk about the most important part of this, which is how to go back to work on Social Security. You see, there's very few people that I've represented now, and I've been doing this work 41 years uh, in Social Security world, 42 as a lawyer. There have been very few that I've represented where it's been my goal to get them benefits so they could just sit at home and wait for a check once a month. It's not a satisfying way to live. It's not a productive way to live. It's not what most of my clients really want. And it's also not the intent of the Social Security Act. You see, Social Security was never intended to support anybody. When Franklin Roosevelt signed the act in 1935, it was intended to help supplant or supplement people's own savings and family support the disability program we view as sort of a transition program to provide people basic financial assistance, access to the healthcare system and give them time to treat, time to recover, time to retrain, and then hopefully time to return to work. And there are very good return to work rules in the law, but they're confusing and people are scared of them. And by the time we're done here tonight, uh, you will understand them. And by the way, uh, I provided a copy of this PowerPoint to Gilda's Club, and you can email them and they'll send it to you. You can email me and I'll send it to you. Either way is fine. Um, and you'll have access to the slides and the information. So before we get into the real substance, let's talk about what COVID has done to the Social Security program because it's really stood it on its head. If we had had this talk pre-COVID, I would have told you, oh my gosh, the DDS at the first level and second level is so efficient and they do good work, but the hearings are just so stuck and you're gonna have this long delay. Since COVID and the pandemic, it's actually turned on its head. And it can now be six to eight to nine months before we even get an adjudicator signed on a new application. Um, and then when we get a ruling and we file for reconsideration, it could be another three or four months to get an adjudicator assigned at that level. However, the hearings are getting scheduled four to five months out from when we file a request for hearing and sometimes even more quickly. So the hearing part is going faster, but the initial and reconsideration cases are just stuck. And it's 
generates lots and lots of frustrated clients calling us saying, how come nothing's happening? And the answer is, I can't do anything about it. A lot of this has to do with politics and Congress's failure since 2019 to increase Social Security's administrative budget. They actually have fewer employees on staff now than they had back then. And if you can imagine with all the baby boomers, there's like 10 or 20,000 people a month going on the program, and yet they have less staff to handle calls and questions and applications. So the system right now is really mired in a political uh, quagmire, and it, it's really unfortunate. Hearings are now on Microsoft Teams or by telephone. They're just starting a few face-to-face -face hearings in certain cases. Um, but Social Security has very strong unions, and they have blocked the reopening of the offices as much as possible. So um, the judges have, they don't call it a union, they call it an association. It's in effect the same thing. Um, and then the, the staff unions have all really tried to keep interaction with the public to a minimum. So that's why we're still doing our hearings on Microsoft Teams and phone, which actually we were scared of this in the beginning, has not turned out that bad. We've not seen any great change in approval or, or ratings, um, which were low anyway, um, but not due to the phone or, or my use of Microsoft Teams. The big problem that we're facing at Social Security is the undertrained and understaffed offices. I mean, you can call Social Security three times, ask the same question, you'll get three different answers. Um, you can try calling Social Security and you have to have a book with you or some work because you'll be on hold for 20 or 30 minutes and then you'll get a recorded message. Hope we were able to resolve your question, goodbye. And then they click on the phone and you have to do it all over again. And that's still happening. And a lot of that is just due to the lack of staff. Denial rates at the ALJ level have increased. They're denying more cases. Uh, the approval rate has dropped more than 20% in the last seven or eight years. And a lot of that is due to political um, pressure that came on the program um, in the last five or six years uh, administrations. And that's just the reality of what we deal with. But we still handle a lot of cases and we still win a lot of cases. So let's talk about it. What we have to prove in any disability case is that our client is totally disabled. But what does that really mean? Let's talk about it. In order for me to get somebody social security disability insurance or SSI benefits, I've got to prove the existence of permanent physical and mental impairment, prove the symptoms of severe preclusive ability to form any substantial gainful activity for a period that's less or expected to last 12 months or result in death. And I said that like that because I knew Sophie was going to write it down and say, this is what the law says. And that's a lot of legal mumble jumble. So let's talk about what it really means. In order for me to get somebody these benefits, I have to be able to prove that they are suffering from symptoms which so impact their day-to-day -day life that they could not function at any kind of full-time job available in the national economy for a period that's lasted or expected to last 12 months or result in death in 12 months. So the focus in most cases, cancer cases are actually the exception, and we'll spend time talking about that. But the focus in most cases is not on the diagnosis. The focus is on the symptoms caused by those medical problems and how those symptoms impact this particular person's ability to do basic work functioning. I get calls all day from people who say, Mr. Rabin, I have sugar, diabetes, and high blood pressure, and I want to get SSI. And my response is always the same. Take your medicine, watch your diet, get a little exercise, and go get a job. Now, that's not to say that those aren't serious medical problems. They are. But generally, they do not produce symptoms, which make it impossible for somebody to answer phones in an office or pack boxes in an Amazon factory. So we're, our, our focus and what we're looking at are the symptoms and their impact on function. So if somebody calls me and they have a physical medical problem, a bad heart, a breathing problem, a bad back, I ask the same questions. How do those symptoms from that physical medical problem 
impact your ability to sit in a chair, stand, walk, lift, reach, push, pull. Those physical motions involved in every job, how are they impacted by the symptoms of that physical medical problem? If I get a call from somebody who has a mental health issue, major depressive disorder, anxiety disorder, PTSD, agoraphobia, um, the most common call by far we get is bipolar. What are the symptoms of that mental impairment and how do they impact this person's ability to do the basic mental motions of work? Understanding and remembering simple instructions, interacting with supervisors and coworkers, um, dealing with stress and change on the job, the mental motions that are involved in every single occupation, how are they impacted by the symptoms from whatever label the psychiatrist put on this person? You see, Social Security almost never disagrees with the diagnosis. If you have a tumor, you have a tumor. If a guy's got a scar six inches down the middle of his back, he has had a back fusion. Social Security's response is, so what? What are the symptoms from that condition? And how are they going to impact this person over 12 months, um, over the next 12 months? Because that's the minimum time period. Which is why COVID, by the way, we got, a, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, we got a lot of calls, I have COVID, get me disability. Well, no, unless you're really a long hauler with a long history of symptoms from having COVID. For the vast majority of people, it was disabling for weeks, months maybe, but not for at least 12 months. And they weren't cases. Now we do have a number of long hauler cases and those are really sad. But let's take an example and let's show you how this works. So let's take a 49 year old Chicago Union carpenter. And he makes, um, last time I checked was $43 an hour um, plus union benefits. So he makes good money. He's climbing the scaffold, scaffold collapses. He crashes to the ground. He fractures a vertebra. He herniates two lumbar discs and he has a major back fusion. He is never going to be a $43 an hour union carpenter. But that's not the law. As you'll remember, you'll remember that I said this is a total disability program. So the focus in this case is not whether this young man could be a carpenter. The issue in his case, could I prove he could not be a ticket taker at a movie theater? It's a sit stand option job. He wears a little blue jacket. He rips the ticket in half. And I don't even know a current movie. The Minions is in door number two, enjoy the show. I've got grandkids, so the Minions I know about. Um, Take a take her to movie theater, coin changer to self-service gas station, shoebox packer in a shoe store, washing machine unloader in a laundromat. These are all jobs performed in the national economy that Social Security has used in the past to deny my clients. A number of years ago, I was representing a lady who'd been a cardiac intensive care nurse in a downtown Chicago hospital, zapping people and saving their lives like we see on TV. She developed rheumatoid arthritis, and this was actually before the biologics, and she ended up with two claw hands. Social Security denied her application, saying that she retained the, and this is a phrase we're going to use a lot, residual functional capacity. Social Security's determination of what this person can do on a sustained basis, despite their medical problems, and they determined that she retained the residual functional capacity to be a bicycle rental clerk. Um, back in the days when you could help substance abusers, and we can no longer help substance abusers because they've been cut out from the program, um, I was representing a young man who had been in the Gateway Foundation Kedzie House program. And at that time, Kedzie was a, a one-year lockdown program to help really keep people clean and teach them new habits and lifestyles. And it was a very effective program. Social Security denied his application. 
saying that he retained the RFC, residual functional capacity, to be a bank vault security guard. Now, when I told Henry the heroin addict they wanted him to guard the bank vault, he said, Mr. Raven, I wish how I wish. Get me the job. Get me the job. Henry was never going to be hired by the bank. And my nurse was never going to go rent bikes. But that's not the test. To get them benefits, I had to prove they could not function at those types of jobs on a 40-hour-a-week basis. If I could, I won. If I could not, Social Security wins and my clients don't get benefits. So if you want to keep one word in mind and one word that makes the difference in every single disability case and summarizes everything we've talked about up till now so whoever has come in late will now be caught up, you want to mark down the word do, D-O. Social security disability claims are not about whether you have a medical problem or whether you're impaired. They're about whether the evidence shows that the symptoms you're suffering from are so severe that you could not do any type of full-time work available in the national economy. And that basic law applies to every social security disability case. Now, there are two programs under disability law um, that are primary that we're going to focus on tonight. The first one is Title II of the Social Security Act, Social Security Disability Insurance, Workers' Disability, Regular Disability, SSDI. We're going to call it SSDI tonight. And the second program is Title 16 of the Social Security Act or Supplemental Security Income or SSI. We're going to call that one SSI. So we have SSDI, SSI. We're going to talk first about SSDI because it is the more comprehensive of the programs. And SSDI has two requirements. First, you have to be totally disabled. That's the medical test that we just discussed. Second, you must have worked and bought the insurance, Social Security Disability Insurance. This is an insurance plan, and it is no different than your car insurance or your homeowner's insurance or your health insurance. Now, I know some of you are sitting there thinking, well, I know I pay my car insurance to Allstate and I know my health insurance is paid by the boss. I don't ever remember writing out a check for social security insurance, but you all have, because every one of you, um, at least that I can see, is of the age where you've had a job. Now, if you talk to my staff, the deal they made with their boss is that for not enough money, they work on too many hours and under too much stress, but that's just the nature of the boss-employee relationship. The truth is, not one of your bosses ever gave you a paycheck for what they agreed. You never got that money. Why? Because every paycheck you've had has a stub attached to it. That stub has a lot of lines. The top line in that stub usually says federal withholding. That's the, <coughs> excuse me. That's the money that goes out to Washington, D.C., and it pays for the Army and the Navy and the Smithsonian Institute and hopefully assistance to help Ukraine get out of their problems. The bottom line on your check stub says state withholding. And that's the money here that goes down to Springfield, and truly only the Lord knows what happens to it when it gets to Springfield. But we know some of it goes for roads and bridges. Um, we know some of it in the past went for that big, empty $80 million prison that sits in the middle of the state. And we know not enough of it goes to Medicaid and, and public education, which are two other um, personal interests of mine. Excuse me. And then... You've got the lines in the middle for the money that goes over the rainbow to the land of FICAville, F-I-C-A. Now, the only faces I saw on here before you all went black, um, none of you are old enough to remember when our checks actually said FICA because it hasn't said that in a number of years. Now it's divided up into two lines. The top one on your stub says O-A-S-D-I. 
old age survivors and disability insurance. And the second line says Medicare. And combined, those are your FICA payments. Now they're matched by the boss. Every dollar taken out of your paycheck for FICA, the boss reaches into her purse and she matches it dollar for dollar. The money goes out to Washington, DC, and it goes into the three social security trust funds. You do not have an account at social security to draw upon. You have no lump sum of money. You don't get interest or dividends. The money is not yours to take. The money goes into the three trust funds and it's combined with everybody else's. <coughs> the biggest trust fund that eats up most of the money is called social security retirement. And that's the money that goes to our senior citizens each month. You have a little one on the side. Now little is in the billion. So little is a relative term here. And that's called social security disability insurance and another little one on the other side and that's called Medicare. And that's how these programs work. We pay our FICA taxes out of our paycheck. The boss, she matches it dollar for dollar. The money goes up into the trust funds and then immediately paid out to current beneficiaries. So those of you who have moms and dads or aunts and uncles or grandparents on social, social security retirement or know people on disability or getting survivor's benefits are getting the money that Sophie paid in last pay period out of her paycheck. So make sure you take her email so that they can all send her thank you notes each month when they get their checks. Whatever is left over in the trust funds at the end of the month that doesn't get spent on current beneficiaries is then loaned to the US government at an absurdly low rate so that they could lie to us about the size of the federal deficit. Because if they really factored in the federal debt plus what they owe social security trust funds, nobody would have any faith in the US economy anymore. And that's how this program works. To qualify for SSDI, you have to meet a two-part FICA test. First, you had to have worked and paid FICA taxes for at least 40 quarters in your lifetime, for at least a, an accumulative 10 years. Second, you must have worked and paid FICA taxes for 20 quarters of the 40 preceding the onset of disability, or five of the last 10 years prior to the date you became totally disabled. Let's, um, well, if you had only worked three of the last 10 years, or you worked for cash and never paid the man a dime, even if you had worked a lot remotely, you would not be eligible for SSDI because your coverage would have expired. So it's a two-part FICA test. If I've paid sufficient quarters of FICA, and now I'm totally disabled, I will be entitled to a monthly check. The amount of that check is a computer formula based upon the amount I earned and paid into the system and my age. It's a very long, complex formula. The average person on um, social security benefits on disability is getting about $1,310 a month to support her family. So despite what a lot of um, conservatives and anti-disabled people say nobody gets rich or comfortable living on SSDI. My dependents would get a check, that is my kids that are up to age 16 or up to 18 and still get high, uh, still in high school, they would split a percentage of my check. Each year there's a cost of living adjustment. There's a lot of talk how the next one will be um, quite significant since they figured in the third quarter of the preceding year and inflation was quite high this year. So the next COLA should be pretty significant. Medicare, the red, white, and blue federal card, kicks in 29 months from the date of onset. And this is said a lot of different ways on the street. Let's take an example. So today is September of 2022. You're going to learn a lot about me today. I'm pretty much an open book kind of guy. And one of the things about me is I'm a very big klutz. And since the pandemic, when my wife and I have both been working from home, she's discovered this amazing thing called Amazon. And she's realized that she plays with her computer and pushes a couple of buttons, by miracle boxes of stuff show up at the door. And she loves it. 
well, I'm a kind of big klutz and I hear the Amazon guy come up and we have a bunch of boxes and I go out there and I'm wearing my slippers and I trip and I fall and I bang my head while I'm picking up one of the boxes. Oh my gosh, she gets worried. She rushes me over to Highland Park Hospital and they do an MRI and they say, oh my God, he's more brain damaged than he was when he got to the Gilded's Club talk. And now I'm totally disabled. Um, we live up in Lake County. So we would contact the Waukegan Social Security Office and say, my wife bought an Amazon box and now I'm totally disabled and I want to get SSDI. Well, you can see the quizzical look on the person's face, but we complete the application. The first thing they're going to ask is, have I worked 40 quarters in my lifetime? Well, a couple of years ago, I actually checked my earnings record. And at the end of this talk, I'll tell you how to, because you should, and found not only do I have 40 quarters, I've got more than 40 years. In fact, now almost 45 years, which really made me feel this gray in here a little bit more. Um, then they ask, pull Jeff's earnings records from 2011 to 2021, the 10 years prior to the year that I became totally disabled, and have I worked at least 20 quarters during that time period. If I've worked 18 quarters, I'm out of luck. But if I've worked 20 and I've worked for 10 years in my lifetime, I'm eligible for SSDI, and they would look at the date that I became totally disabled. So in this case, it's September 21 of 2022. SSDI has a five month, what they call elimination period. We call it a starvation period. So no matter how disabled I am on SSDI, I do not get a check for October, November, December, January, February. My first check would be March of 2023. Medicare kicks in March of 2025. Two years, five months, from the date I became totally disabled, 29 months. Two exceptions to that rule. One, for people with um, kidney dialysis, and two, for people with Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, only one reason for those two exceptions, there were senators who had people that they knew were family members that they thought needed Medicare quicker, so they got those two conditions exempted from the 29-month waiting period. It's absurd. There is a bill pending in Congress to eliminate that 29-month wait and also to eliminate the five-month elimination period. But there is a faction in Congress that is not in support of any additional help for the disabled or the poor or for the needy or for any expanding of social benefits. I'll let you decide who that party in the Senate may be. Um, nothing is going to pass. Um, you have to vote, you have to vote, you have to vote. It makes a difference. All right, that's the basics of the SSDI program. Let's talk about supplemental security income. SSI came about in 1971 as a result of a series of pictorial art articles in Look and Life magazine, which depicted the difference in living conditions between the elderly poor in the North who are getting some help from cities and townships in their local communities, and the elderly poor in the South who were not, and were living in shanties and lean-tos and literally using um, cat food tins for saucers and eating out of cat food tins. Congress thought it bad that our seniors were eating out of cat food tins and um, enacted SSI to help the elderly poor and then expanded it to help the disabled poor. So SSI also has two requirements. Number one, you must be totally disabled. That's the medical test we discussed at the beginning. Second, you must be indigent. What does indigent mean? Indigent means no money coming into the household other than possibly TANF benefits and less than $2,000 in non-excludable resources. What are non-excludable resources? Well, you're allowed a house if you're living in it. You can own the house, it doesn't count. You're allowed one car because you have to go to the doctor and the therapist and the pharmacy. Um, they won't value the clothes on your back, but they will look inside your purse for cash. They will look for checking accounts, savings accounts, IRAs, 401ks, 203Bs, cash value life insurance, 
family trusts, U.S. savings bonds, um, residential investment properties, any asset that can be converted to cash, even if you have to pay a tax and a penalty to access it, counts against the $2,000 limitation. So SSI is a program for people who are permanently and totally disabled with very, very limited financial means. If you meet those two requirements and you're living independently, you will be eligible for $841 a month this year, plus Medicaid, the state health system, and food stamps. Now, this is a program that, again, one portion of the Congress hates because this money does not come from the trust funds. This comes <coughs> from general revenues. So it makes it harder to give corporate tax cuts or to buy another uh, Navy warship when you're paying SSI benefits. But realize somebody who's getting $841 a month is still living 25% below the poverty level in the United States. So nobody is comfortable living on SSI, but it's there and it helps. But there's a gap in these two programs. The gap comes up a lot on calls we get for cancer cases. So there's a little longer story, but I'm gonna go through it um, with you all tonight. I've averaged this call at least once a week for 40 years. Now, I'm one guy sitting in one office, either here at home or in Park Ridge. And if I'm getting that call, probably more than once a week. Um, that frequently in my career, you can see if we spread it out nationwide, how big the problem is of deeming. Deeming is really evil. And here's how it works. We're going to take a young woman who graduates college, does very well, has a great job. She's working that job for a few years and she meets Mr. Wonderful. Now we're in the 90s. In the 90s, Mr. Wonderful, he is working in a young company in IT and it is exploding. And they get married and they have one, two, three kids. And this company is just going gangbusters and it goes public and he gets stocks and bonuses and warrants. And she says, I'm blessed. I'm married to this wonderful provider. I can make the choice of being a stay-at-home mom and help raise my kids. And that's important to me, so I'm going to make that choice. Well, now we get into the 2000s, and there's a big crash in 2008. And his company shuts down or gets absorbed. He gets laid off. He moves to another company. It doesn't work out. We're now in the 2020s, and he's working for a small consulting firm in Oak Brook Terrace. In the meantime, one, two, three girls, they're grown. The, the oldest is 22. She just graduated college. The middle one is 21, and she's in her last year of college. And the baby's 19 and just starting college. So they've had tons of college expenses. Now, this small consulting firm in Oak Brook, they don't pay for family health insurance. They cover him, but he would have to pay a lot of money out of his pocket to cover his wife. And the kids are covered under college. He says, you know what, honey, you've been healthy. We have all these bills. You just don't need health insurance. Now, under the Affordable Care Act, that's supposed to be illegal. But the last administration in Congress had that illegality taken away. So the family makes this choice. Woman's now 48. And she gets hit by a car. Or she's diagnosed with breast cancer. Or she's diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And we'll use that one because that's an easy one for me to use. And she comes to me and says, Jeff, please get me SSDI and Medicare because I want to be able to take the medications and I want to be able to see the best uh, MS clinics in Chicago and I don't want to end up in, in a scooter. I can't get her SSDI and Medicare. How come? Because she's not worked. I would make you answer if we were in a room. Um, She's not worked five out of the last 10 years on a job paying FICA taxes. Then she says, okay, please get me SSI and Medicaid because Medicaid will pay for Avonex. That's the entry level MS drug and keep her, uh, make her be able to use her legs and keep her out of a scooter. I can't get her SSI because of deeming. Deeming says what belongs to me belongs to my wife, Sherry. 
what belongs to Sherry belongs to me. What belongs to the two of us belongs to our minor children. So this lady is not indigent because her husband is working and has a 401k. The country, this country turns its back on stay-at-home moms. All this talk that you hear from politicians, family values, family values, ban the books, protect the family, close the library. They put no value on a mom or a dad who stays home to raise the kids. And there've been laws proposed to change this, but again, they aren't going anywhere despite the views of family values. But that's only part one of the story. Part two of the story is husband looks at her and says, you're sick and you're not fun anymore. And he's out the door. A huge percentage of my clients are divorced because of the stress, the medical problems put on the family. But she hires a good lawyer. And, you know, he's been working all these jobs. He's got $250,000 saved up in his 401k. And she gets half of that for her old age. She's entitled to it. Um, in fact, if she'd hired my ex as lawyer, she'd have gotten 55% and not just 50, but that's another part of my life that we don't need to go any more into. But um, she gets $125,000. She can't get SSI because that's an asset. The only way this country will help her is if she cracks the, I, the 401k, pays taxes, pays the penalty, blows it down below $2,000, and then we'll give her $841 a month to live on. And all of that is a result of deeming. This happens every day across the country all the time. And it's a really bad thing, but it is what the law is until someday there's politicians who care enough about the disabled to make a change. So these are our two programs. We have SSDI, totally disabled, worked and paid FICA taxes. We have SSI, totally disabled and indigent. Now, how does Social Security actually apply this law? Now we're going to leave the statute book and we're going to go into something called the regulations or the fine print. And there's volumes and pages and pages and pages of regulations to tell Social Security how to actually apply this law. And in truth, the regulations are, there are then amplified by something called the Program Operation Manual System called the POMS. Those are re-explained by something called the HALEX. Those are reinterpreted by something called the rulings. And all of those are reinterpreted by the federal courts. So even though I'm in this little niche area of law, there's lots and lots of law and paper involved. But in the regulations, there is something called the sequential evaluation procedure, which is an analytical framework used by every single decision maker at every level of the process. Adjudicators, judges, appeals counsel, federal court, everybody applies the same analytical framework. But I hope by now that you've come to realize I'm not your typical attorney. Um, I'm a roofer's kid. And the only reason I'm an attorney is my dad threw me out of the roofing business because of my being such a klutz and not good at it. And I couldn't find a good journalism school, a job after J school. And so I became an attorney. I can only say sequential evaluation procedure twice in a day and my tongue goes on strike. Instead, I talk about climbing the ladder because that's how I grew up with the ladders rattling in the back of my dad's Pontiac and the smell of hot tar, which to me is still the greatest smell in the whole world because that was my home and my life and my education. Let's climb the ladder that Social Security uses in every case. But before we do that, we start at the ground level and that's something called compassionate allowances. So for some reason that nobody can fathom, the current administration has not appointed a new commissioner of Social Security there's only an interim person, and nobody knows why the president has not gotten around to a program that affects 65 million people, but he hasn't. Um, but about 10, 12 years ago, we actually had a good commissioner for a short while, and his name was Michael Astrew. And he said, you know what? We pay some cases all the time. And if we pay them all the time, 
why are we putting people through all this nonsense of appeal and deny and hearings and all that? Let's just pay them. And he started out with a list of 50 conditions. It's now grown to about 225 and 12 more were added just last week. So that's hot off the news, hot off the press news. And most of these things are things you've never heard of. There are conditions 22 letters long, but some of them are more obvious, uh, brain cancer, uh, lung cancer, uh, throat cancer, are automatically paid cases. And we're gonna go through a little bit of that list in just a moment. So the goal here is if somebody has a compassionate allowance and it could be Alzheimer's, it could be Huntington disease, these are conditions that people are not going to quickly ever or ever recover from. So it's not, your bad back or I'm depressed type case, those aren't covered as compassion allowances. It's a very definitive list and you can get it by Googling it or calling my office either way. If you have a compassion allowance, back in the beginning of this program, you were to go into the disability office, tell them and you were to be put in pay status in 10 days. Nothing happens in 10 days anymore at social security, but compassion allowance cases do get expedited and handled separately in order to try to get them into pay status more quickly. Assuming you do not have a compassion allowance condition, you go to step one on the ladder, which asks, is this person involved in substantial gainful activity, SGA? Make it simpler. Are they working? Make it even simpler. Are they doing any full or part-time activity, which is generating $1,350 gross in a month? If they're making $1,350, they're considered to be involved in work, and their case is generally denied at step one. Assuming they're not working, we go to step two of the ladder. Step two of the ladder says, does the evidence show that there is a severe impairment? Now, severe has the opposite meaning of what you would think. Severe for this purpose means, does the evidence show that this condition is producing symptoms which in some at least minimal way impact the person's ability to function. And this is where we rule out the hypertension cases and the adult onset diabetes cases. And here's the best example for you to, of a non-severe impairment. Somebody with a seizure disorder controlled by medications. Now a seizure disorder or epilepsy, that's a bad condition, that's scary. But remember, I said controlled by medications. And if you go back to the very beginning of our talk, we talked diagnosis, epilepsy is scary, is not the focus. The focus is on the symptoms from the diagnosis. And if this person's seizures are controlled by medication, so they're not having seizures anymore, they're not having symptoms anymore, and they're denied at step two of the ladder. And that's a very common call again that we get in our office. Let's assume our person is not working and has a condition that does impact their function. We then go to step three of the listings where the question is, does the medical evidence, I'm sorry, step three of the analysis or the latter, which asks, does the medical evidence show that this condition meets or equals the listings of impairments? Now, the listings of impairments are a long set of medical criteria in the, re in the regulations, lots of different types of conditions. There's listings for back problems, blood problems, stomach problems, mental health problems, systemic problems like lupus and scleroderma, and there's a, list, a, a listing for metastatic conditions. This is a very high threshold. Cut my arm off, I do not meet the musculoskeletal listings cut my arm and my leg off and I'm a double amputee and then I do. Um, but it's this, always the first place we look because as the judge is processing the case in her mind, she's walking up this ladder just like we are tonight. So if we know we can meet a listing, we know we can get that case paid easily, that's the first place we look. But let's assume this condition is severe, it impacts function, but it's not so bad it meets the listing. We then go to step four on the ladder. Now, what do we know? We know our person isn't working. We know our person is impaired. She's got a severe impairment. 
but we know it's not so bad it meets the crazy requirements of the listings. Now we ask, what is her, remember that phrase we talked about earlier, residual functional capacity? And is she able to function at any of the kinds of jobs she's done in the last 15 years? Now that doesn't mean could she get the job, the jobs may not exist anymore. She may have worked in the steel mills and those jobs are all in Korea or at the Zenith plant in Melrose and that's all down in Mexico. Or it could have been Colette and she may have been working at the Hallmark store down the street. And that lady says, I wouldn't have Colette back here for all the tea in China. She was terrible. It doesn't matter whether Colette could get that job or not. The question is, could she function at that type of job? If the answer is yes, we get denied at step four. If the answer is no, we now go to step five. And what do we know at step five? And Colette, thank you for letting me pick on you right now, but you're the next one up in my screen. Um, we know that she's not working. We know she has an impairment that impacts function. We know it's not so bad that it meets the listings. We know it's bad enough she can't do her old work. Now, considering her age, her education, her work skills, and most important, her residual functional capacity, are there other jobs available in the national economy? If there are, we lose. That's when we get into the ticket taker and the washing machine unloader and the surveillance operator and the telephone receptionist type jobs. If we can prove she could not do those on an eight hour a day, five day a week basis, we win and she gets the help. Every single SSDI, disabled adult child, SSI, widow's disability case, every one of them goes through this exact same analysis. Let's pick it apart a little bit. So compassion allowances, there's a lot of conditions. I said there's over 200, but some that are more relevant to this group are adrenal cancer, automatically awarded benefits, adult non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We're gonna put bladder, or we're gonna put breast cancer off to the side and bladder cancer off to the side for a moment. <coughs> but you see here a list, the gliomas for the brain cancers. Uh, there's a lot of conditions um, that are in the compassion allowance list that relate to cancers that will get paid right away. And if you call us with one of those, then we'll either explain to you how you can go ahead and file it on your own. And then if you really want us and, and have to pay us the fee, we're happy to do it for you. But we will also tell people how they can on their own file their application and try to get the benefits approved. Usually all that it needs is a short letter from the oncologist confirming the diagnosis and one paragraph saying how they came to the diagnosis. And that should be enough to put the case into pay status while they develop the rest of the evidence. If we don't have a compassion allowance, the listings for cancer cases is in section 13 of the listings of impairments. Everything in cancer cases really turns on that third bullet point, metastases beyond the regional lymph nodes. And I told you we were going to put breast and bladder cancer off to the side because the same issue applies to both of them, but particularly breast cancer cases. What's happened in our experience over the years is that regular breast cancer, breast cancer that's found early, the woman feels a lump, she gets to the doctor, she has the biopsy, um, they make a medical plan, they do a lumpectomy or a mastectomy. They do some radiation, they do some chemotherapy. This whole thing is done in less than a year. Very often, we are, what we see a lot is like nine months. Well, if they're completed their treatment at nine months and the cancer has not reoccurred, I don't have a 12 month period. Now, if the cancer reoccurs or if the cancer bullet point number three metastasizes beyond the regional lymph nodes, that will meet the listing because that's what Social Security considers an, oh my gosh, more severe form of cancer. Now, we've handled some breast cancer cases where there's resulting ongoing symptoms. Proving the effects of chemotherapy is tough because the oncologist won't usually help us, but many women especially have lymphedema 
And depending on their age and their work history, it, it's hard to prove lymphedema impacts work for somebody with a college degree who's done office work. But if they have a, a lesser education and they've been doing physical labor their whole life, uh, lymphedema, and especially in the arm, makes it very uh, difficult for somebody to sustain work. So every case turns on its own facts. Um, and in fact, that comes up at step five and where we're dealing with the ability, the issues, the ability to work five days a week, eight hours a day, where age is a key factor, where Social Security does say it's harder for people over 50 with less than a high school degree. It's harder even for people 55 and over and harder again for people 60 and over. Um, there is a push to eliminate that because there's a branch of the Congress that feels everybody can use a computer these days. And so we shouldn't be considering age as a factor or education. And of course, that's nonsense. And hopefully that will not become the law, but there's a big, big push in the intellectual community to go in that route. Pain, fatigue especially is a major disabling symptom, just hard to prove and quantify. And we spend a lot of time in our office with every new client teaching them how to communicate about fatigue and how to communicate about pain. Depression, especially for cancer patients, is a very common, common problem. Um, if they treat for it with a psychiatrist or and a therapist or a good psychologist, that can be the basis for disability. The key thing to remember in all of this is Social Security is function-driven. It's not diagnosis-driven. So our focus is on the evidence of your symptoms and their impact on your day-to-day -day life. Okay, let's switch and go to the most important slide of the night. This is the key. I've talked a lot about how the program's becoming more difficult. I've talked about how hard the listings are. I've talked about some of the nonsense at Social Security, and all of that is true, very true. But we win a lot of cases. And not just me, but the people that I advocate in, in, in the same role as I do. We win a lot of cases. And it's important that we win cases. And I'm just going to talk about myself and my office now. But there's two reasons in my office why it's really important that we win cases. Number one, in my office, and I'm being very careful about how I say that, um, we turn away about 70% of the people that call us. Um, because they don't have enough quarters, or there's deeming issues, or they're not treating, or we just don't think their conditions are that bad and they should go to work. Um, so when we do take a case, it's because we really believe that client is entitled to this help, and we're going to go to the mat if we have to and do everything we can to try to get them the benefits because we truly believe them. The second reason why it's important to get benefits, and this is a little more crude, but it's the only way I get paid. None of my clients have money. They're not working. Nobody gives me a retainer. Nobody gives me money up front. Nobody gets an hourly bill. I only get paid if I win. So winning is really important. Three rules about winning. Three things that are crucial. Rule number one, you must be going to the doctor. You must be going to the doctor. You must be going to the doctor. I cannot say it enough. These are medical cases that turn on medical evidence of medically determinable symptoms and their impact on function. Everything turns on the medical charts. You must be going to the doctors. An anal the analogy that I hate is, um, People like to think of their lawyer as their gunslinger. Well, I've never shot a gun in my life except a BB gun when I was a kid. I wouldn't know how to load and shoot a gun except maybe a Winchester because I watch John Wayne movies and I see how he does it. But other than that, I wouldn't know what to do with a gun. I couldn't shoot bullets. I shoot MRI reports. I shoot Beck Depression inventories. I shoot the reports from the treating art therapist and counselors. Those are my bullets. If I do not have those records and reports, I have no way to advocate for my clients. Plus, put yourself in the shoes of a judge. 
judges are under huge pressure to deny more cases, huge pressure from the internal bureaucrats that have been entranced at Social Security for too many years. They're going to hear six cases a day. A, a good judge, liberal, liberal, liberal judge will pay three. Uh, the typical judge, two, and, and a lot of judges, only one. And then here's six cases and four of them have stacks of records and tests and they're going to therapies and treatments. And two come in and say, oh, judge, I don't have any insurance and they're mean to me at the county and I haven't been to the doctor in a year and send me a check. Judge isn't gonna do it. They're gonna wanna help the people that are trying to help themselves. So rule number one, you must be going to the doctor. Rule number two, and now I'm gonna pick on Sophie again. There's a right way and a wrong way to go to the doctor. And this is really important. So I told you all that my dad was a roofer. He had a little roofing company and he was a great guy. I mean, my dad was fantastic. Both my parents were, and they've been gone for many, many, many years. Um, but my brothers and I were blessed and we know it. And my dad's still my hero. And I learned a lot from my dad. One of the things I learned from my dad is he was a tough guy and he'd be up there on the roof using his hatchet with the guys chopping off the old roof to put on the new one. And remember, I told you how klutzy I am. I got it from him and whack that hatchet would hit his arm and he put a big gash in his arm. He wouldn't stop the job. The job had to get done. He'd spit on it. He'd put a glob of tar on it to close it up and he'd finish the job and he'd go home and my mom would look at him and said, oi, Bobby, you did it again. But that was my dad. He never complained. Whatever was in front of him, he took on and accomplished. The other thing about my dad that I learned is he was a really, really good flirt. I mean, my dad flirted all the time. And I can't tell you how many times as kids we'd be outside a restaurant and my mom would be puffing on those cigarettes that killed her at 58 with lung cancer. And she'd be stomping her foot on the sidewalk. And she thought my dad was um, paying the cashier. No, my dad was playing with the cashier because he flirted and he taught me and I'm pretty good flirt too. Now, Dr. Sophie here, she's my psychiatrist and I'm coming in to see her today. And you all can tell because she keeps her screen on, which we appreciate that she just has this incredibly nice smile. Well, I like that smile and I like Dr. Sophie's. Today's my day for my appointment. What do I do? I do the same thing every single one of you do. I take a shower before my appointment. I shave what can be shaved. I trim what needs to be trimmed. I pat down what's left to be patted down. I put on a clean shirt. I walk into her office. She says, hi, Jeff, how are you today? And again, I answer her the same way all of you do. I say, I'm okay, doc, how are you? And I just lost my disability case. Because what does she chart? Well-groomed, nice man says he's okay. Next month I come in. Now this time the shirt's a little wrinkled and my eyes are red and I have this thing that the mental health people call a flat affect. I always think of the flat iron on a Monopoly board, um, but it means I look sad. And she says, Jeff, I'm a little concerned. Are there any new symptoms? Maybe we need to adjust your medications. Now, I don't know how many of you have worked with people with mental health issues, but the worst thing you can ever say to a person with mental health issues is, I'm going to adjust your medications. I've been on Prozac, I've been on Seroquel, I've been on Lexapro, I like the Wellbutrin. Getting on and off these medicines is a roller coaster. I don't want to do that. No, 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 Doc Sophie. There's no new symptoms. It's just a tough week. My kid got a D on his report card. The puppy pooped on the carpeting. And really, there's no new symptoms. What does she chart? Jeff says no new symptoms. Next month, I come in. Now I'm a mess. The clothes are dirty. I haven't shaved in a bunch of days. What's left is going in different directions. And when I walk into her office, she has to reach down for that Febreze bottle that we keep in our offices for certain new clients. And she says, Jeff, I'm really concerned. Are you sure things are stable? Maybe we need to talk about that day hospitalization program over at Lutheran General. What do I hear? Hospital. 
I've been in Good Samaritan. I've been in Linden Oaks. I've been in Evanston. Mental health hospitals are not nice places. I don't want to go back. No, 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 Doc, really, I'm stable. It was just another bad week, and I had to go to the principal to talk about my kid, and the dog got in a fight with another dog, and I had to heal. It was just a bad week. What does she chart? Jeff says he's stable. By law, we have to turn in every single medical paper on you that can be found, favorable or unfavorable. We have to give it to the judge. And what does the judge read? Jeff says he's stable. Jeff says no new symptoms. Jeff says he's okay. Okay, case denied. Jeff said so. I've lost disability cases because my clients lie to the doctor. Now, I lied to be polite. I lied to be flirtatious. I lied because I didn't want to go to the hospital. I had really good reasons for lying. Doesn't matter. Her charts will control. So the key when you go to the doctor is to complain more on slash explain what's really going on in your life. And we spend a lot of time with new clients teaching this to them. And I believe that any lawyer who doesn't is not doing a good job for their clients. We talk about, talk about the person that you see in the mirror because that mirror doesn't have an ego. If you wanna write down a mantra, the mantra to write down is every symptom, every doctor, every visit. Even if the doctor's rolling her eyes at you, spit it out, it goes in the chart. When it goes in the chart, it becomes evidence. If it's not in the chart, it doesn't exist. We tell clients all the time, we are really good at arguing the evidence. We cannot create it. The evidence is created the minute you walk into Dr. Sophie's office. Rule number three, Social Security wants specialists. The family doctor providing Prozac for depression is not evidence of mental illness. If your problem is cancer, you have to be seeing the oncologist if the, and on a regular basis. If the problem is um, Depression, you have to be treating with either a psychiatrist with a social worker, because psychiatrists just do the medication and not the functions, or a good psychologist. If your problem's fibromyalgia, it's the rheumatologist or the pain specialist. If it's a bad back, it's the orthopedic or the neurologist or the pain doctor. Social Security wants specialists. Family doctors, unfortunately, have a very limited role to play in the social security disability symptom. These three rules are critical to ever having an application approved. And if you want to remember, I, have, I told you I have a bunch of grandchildren and my oldest one is six and he really loved that song. It's all about the base, about the base. Well, in our world, it's all about the charts, about the charts. The charts mean everything. All right, I have a few more minutes. Um, we know the law, how does it get applied? Cases start with initial application. We actually do those for our new clients. And we actually have one and a half staff people, the half being one of my stepdaughters when she's not with my grandchildren, um, whose only job is doing uh, applications for our clients. Um, when you file a case with Social Security, the first thing they do is drop it. And they subcontract it out to the state. Every state has a contract with Social Security to provide an office called DDS, or in Illinois, we call it BDDS, Bureau of Disability Determination Services, and your file nowadays eventually will get to an adjudicator. And their job is to gather paper. They send out to your doctors and your counselors and the hospitals. They send you a work history form. They send, then send you the most dangerous of the forms, which is the activities of daily living questionnaire. And our goal with new business is to be hired for sure before somebody fills out an activities of daily living questionnaire, because that's the killer form. That form is a statement by you of what you think you can do during the day. And you say, they asked, do you cook? And, yeah, I cook. 
your view of cooking is taking a frozen meal, punching up four holes in it and putting it into the microwave. They say, oh, you can cook. You can chop the salad. You can make the soup. You can cook the chicken. You can put it all on plates. You can serve it. You can stand at the dish at the sink where now we're washing the dishes. You can cook. You can work. So that form is really a critical form. At, in Illinois, at the first level, 35% of the cases get approved, 65 get denied. The ones get approved are the compassionate allowance cases, and then really obvious cases like double amputations or strokes and bedridden or really severe chronic mental illness with repeated hospitalizations. If you get denied, we get to file an appeal. You don't give up, you go to reconsideration. There you get assigned to a new adjudicator and you repeat the process from the first level. In Illinois, only 10% of the cases get approved at reconsideration, 90% get denied. If you get denied, we don't give up. We then file a request for a hearing before an administrative law judge. This is the most important step in the process because this is the only time that you'll ever get to see, at least on Microsoft Teams, or talk to the decision maker. Everything up to this time is decided by hidden social security doctors and job experts that you'll never see or talk to um, and by the adjudicator. It's only at the administrative law judge hearing that you get to actually talk to the person that decides your case. It's the most important part of the program. Everybody that lives Foster Avenue North to Wisconsin and West to uh, Rockford has their cases heard in the Evanston Hearing Office. Everybody that lives west of Chicago has their case heard at Oak Brook Terrace or in the, by those judges. South of Chicago is Orland Park. And everybody in the city up to Foster Avenue has their cases heard by the downtown Chicago judges. Some of the judges are fair. None of the judges are particularly liberal anymore. Those have literally been forced out of the program. And some of the judges are just mean and evil with very low approval rates um, that we know it's very unlikely we'll win the case, but we're preparing for the next steps. And if we do lose the case, the next step is the Appeals Council. That's in Falls Church, Virginia. You do not see them or talk to them. It's just a paper review of what the judge did. And they support the judge about 92% of the time. If we lose there, we then can sue Social Security in the United States District Court. You do not see them, you do not talk to them, you do not get a hearing. It's all based upon what happened at the administrative law judge hearing. That administrative law judge hearing sets the record with very little room to maneuver around that. So that's the key. We wanna have the strongest possible case by the time you see the administrative law judge and that's why we like to get hired right at initial application so we can spend a lot of time talking with you about what the key evidence is in your case. And you can be creating that evidence through your doctor treatment um, by, so that by the time we see an ALJ, we have a strong record that documents what's really happening in your life. These are the steps that happen in every single um, case. In the United States District Court, we live in something called the Seventh Circuit, which used to be very liberal, but the last couple of the judges that were appointed by the prior administration are very anti the disabled person and have actually undone a lot of the favorable decisions we've gotten from Judge Posner, who had retired um, in the prior 10 years or so. All right, we're going to cut through this because now I want to talk switch gears. Now we're going to talk about people who are getting benefits because this came up before we started our talk tonight. Everybody getting benefits is going to be reviewed. Everybody. A number of years ago, Congress gave Social Security $3 billion with a B to do nothing but reviews. And again, depending upon your um, political persuasion, reviewing people to kick them off is a major function of Social Security. Yes or no, depends. But I don't have a problem with reviewing people. They should, because people do get better. So the test and review is, is there medical evidence of medical improvement sufficient to allow this person to return to work? 
medical evidence of medical improvement. So I'm going to pick on Vanessa now because I saw her face at the beginning. And you all might know Vanessa. She's really stubborn. And she was one of my most stubborn clients. And I had to yell at her, Vanessa, go to the doctor, go to the doctor, go to the doctor. She went to the doctor. We won our case and she stopped. Now she stopped because I wasn't nudging her anymore. She stopped maybe because the doctor said, I can't do any more for you. You know, you are what you are. A year later, she gets a letter from Social Security, which of course Vanessa ignores. And then she gets a follow-up phone call from the adjudicator saying, hey, Vanessa, we wrote to you and told you we're doing a continuing disability review. And the test is, is there medical evidence of medical improvement? So we start by going to your doctors to see what their records say. Who are your doctors? And Vanessa goes, well, I haven't been to the doctor in a year. Jeff isn't nudging me anymore. And a big smile comes to the adjudicator's face. And he says, honey, don't worry. I'll send you for one of our doctors for a consultative examination. He'll take care of you. Now, I don't know if any of you have been to a consultative examination. I was able to sit in on one, and it was a joke. It's get on the table, get off the table, walk heel to toe. How many fingers am I holding up? And what's the difference between an apple and an orange? You can't tell pain. You can't tell fatigue. You can't tell how somebody is functioning eight hours a day, five days a week. And Vanessa is going to get terminated. So if you're getting benefits now, what's the rule? You must be going to the doctor. Number one, I want you to get better. But number two, if you're not, we need to be documenting where you're at so that when you have a review, there's current medical evidence of how you're performing. So to the lady that we had spoken to earlier who felt one of the reasons she got denied was because of her husband, not likely. There was more reason she got denied was because she didn't have evidence to show how that she was still suffering from a lot of symptoms and had a lot of impairments. And there was medical evidence that showed medical improvement. And very possibly, she was communicating to her doctors incorrectly. These are very common things, not judgmental. This is normal. Nobody understands these rules unless you live in this world like I do. Now, but let's go one step better with Vanessa. And she stopped going to the doctor because she is getting better and she wants to go back to work. How do you go back to work without screwing things up? First, you have to determine, am I on SSDI or SSI? Because the rules are different. So let's start out with the rules for people who are on SSDI. They have three benefits. Number one, they're allowed the trial work period. And this allows them to work and earn as much as they can, 2000 a month, 4000 a month, 6000 a month and still get their disability check. So cash flow is wonderful because you got cash coming in from all these directions. You're allowed nine trial work period months, but that would be too easy to say it's nine months out of 12. It's nine months out of any five year slice of time. So example, I go on disability in 2014. I work three months in 2017 three months in 2018, and three months in 2021. Between 2017 and 2021 is less than five years. So I've worked nine months in less than a five-year period. I've used up my trial work period. I go on disability in 2014. I worked three months in 2015, three months in 2020, three months in 2021. By 2021, those months I worked in 2015 are outside of the five-year slice of time and they don't apply anymore. The reason I spend time on this is when Sophie is at Gilda's Club and somebody says to her, hey, I wanna go back to work, how many months can I work and still get my benefits? Her answer is always going to be, I don't know because she does not know how many months you worked a year ago or two years ago or four years ago. You use up one trial work period this month, this year, with any month, you earn at least $970 gross in a month. Last year, it was nine forty. dollars It changes every year with the cost of living, which is good because that means Sophie has to have me back next year because we'll have new numbers to talk about. 
But nine months for somebody who's chronically ill and found totally disabled doesn't tell us a lot. And the law recognizes that and has a second benefit for people on SSDI called the extended period of eligibility. And that says, okay, you were disabled, you've worked nine months. Now you're gonna work. And if you continue to work and now make over $1,350 a month, we're not gonna give you any more checks. But if at any time in the next three years, you become unable to make $1,350 gross in a month, right back on the program, no questions asked. So if Colette is working and the company, uh, she relapses or she's working at Hallmark and the boss says you're fired and she's under 1,350 and she's still within three years of the end of her trial work period, right back on the program, no questions asked. The third benefit, remember I told you to get Medicare on social security disability insurance? Nobody wants to lose their Medicare. And this was really, really critical before the Affordable Care Act came into place. Um, but you get to keep your Medicare for the nine month trial work period, the three year extended period of eligibility, even if you're earning more than 1350 and not getting checks, and for another four and a half years after that. So you can keep Medicare for almost nine years after you return to work if you're on SSDI. Very important benefit. SSI is different. SSI is a math test. And it basically works like this. Because remember, SSI is means tested. Assets and income make a difference. And now you're going to have income. So basically what they do is they ignore the first $85 that you earn. 65 for one reason, 20 for another. The numbers have not changed since 1979. And I know I sound like a broken record, but yes, there's a bill to increase those numbers pending in the Senate. And no, it's not going to pass. Um, they ignore the first $85 you earn. And after that, they reduce your check by $1 for every two that you generate in income. So we'll pick on Vanessa again, and she's on SSI. And she's getting her 841. And she does Mary Kay work, and she sells $285 in cosmetics. 85 is ignored, that leaves 200. It's a one for two reduction. Therefore, she'll lose $100 off her next SSI check and she'll only get $741. But 741 and 285 is still better than just getting the $841 in SSI benefits. So it still pays to work. Here's the key. Whenever you're on disability, you must be reporting changes to social security. You go to work, you tell them. You move, you tell them. You get married, you tell them. You change banks, you better tell them or you're not getting your next check. Very critical that you communicate with Social Security. But how do you do that? Well, you can call the 1-800 number and you'll hear Mrs. Smith typing. But is she typing in your information or is she writing a letter to her sister? You'll never know and you'll never be able to prove a phone call. The best way to report if you're on SSI is there's an app, Social Security Mobile Wage Reporting app, download it on your phone, report every month's earnings on there. There's an electronic record kept and you can prove it. If you're on SSDI, open up an account on My Social Security, we'll talk about that in a minute, and provide the work information on your um, my Social Security platform on Social Security's website. You are responsible to report. You must be able to prove you reported. This is not something that's optional or that you can make an excuse about. All right. Thanks to Kathleen, Lindsay, Sophie for putting this all together today. This is a lot of work, and I really appreciate it. Gilda's Club is special. I've been involved with Gilda's Club for many, many, many years. And Kathleen Boss is just one of my heroes for all the work that she does for people. She's, she's remarkable. And this is a place where you can find support that your doctors don't give you and your family is often unable to give you. So I really appreciate the work of Gilda's Club and the other cancer centers around Chicago. Um, and it's my pleasure and privilege to be able to work with you guys tonight.
For those of you that are medical professionals, case managers, case uh, social workers, medical providers, we do a professional newsletter. So if you are fall into one of those groups, send me an email with your snail mail address because we still send it out by snail mail and we'll be happy to put you on the list for the newsletter. Couple of things, um, rkblegal.com is our website. There's a lot of information on there. You can get a lot of answers. You can also contact us off the website. I told you I'm a member of CHARGE, which is really an important group that's kind of come up with new and novel ways to integrate medical care with homeless services um, to help people. Very proud of my associate, Emma Drozdowski Webb, who lives in Knoxville. And we're able now because of teams and internet to have an attorney work with us in Knoxville, Tennessee. And she was just named chairperson of the Tennessee Bar Association Social Security Disability Committee. Everybody should join my social security. Now, here's how you do that. You go to ssa.gov and make sure it's .gov because if you go to .com, you're going to end up in lawyer marketing swirl that you don't want to have any part of. So go to ssa.gov. On the left side is a little button called My Social Security. You'll be able to see your work quarters. You'll be able to confirm they didn't make a mistake. They actually made a mistake in mine, but it was so long ago now, it doesn't matter. Um, you'll be able to see how much you got if you went on disability or if you retired. So it's very important financial information. And it's also the way if you're on SSDI that you can report um, changes in your work income to the government. There's our information and my um, email address. I have a wonderful team of admin people, paralegals, and attorneys, and I'm very proud of them. We will do whatever we can to support the work of Gilders Club. So you don't have to call us to hire us. If you have a question, if something doesn't make sense, shoot me an email or call us. You may talk with Kelly, who's our intake director or one of the other members of our team. I am going to be out of town next month for a little vacation, but we will absolutely try our best to, to meet your needs, um, whether or not you hire us to be your representative. The only thing we can't do is if you have a representative, we can't interfere with that. Um, so we'll you know, answer general questions, but we can't interfere with your current rep unless you're determined to leave them. I talked a lot. I covered the whole 90 minutes. Is there any questions? Uh, I mean, I can stick around. I, Sophie, I don't know what your situation is. but And then thank